I feel like preaching. Uh, well, no. I wasn't expecting that. Hey, Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. And here's the reason. Um, God's word just fires me up. I just, I just love um, the scriptures. Um, and, I, and I count it a joy to know that there's nothing I can say that can, that can change anybody's life. God wrote a book. And we want to lean in, not to the preacher, but lean into the scripture. Uh, for God's word changes lives. Um, and if God doesn't show up, we're just a bunch of religious people with no power. And so I want to invite you to meet me in a very powerful passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. As this is a standalone message. We, we finished the series in Proverbs last week. Pastor Brett uh, closed us out. And, and today is a standalone message. But I want to read to you um, the powerful text of scripture uh, found in Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll conclude our time today in um, taking the Lord's table and in communion. But I'm going to read to you these powerful verses. I'm reading from the ESV, Hebrews chapter 12, pick up in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance in the race that is set before us. Underline this phrase. Looking to Jesus, mm, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to put a tag on this text, a winning life. A winning life. Oh, Father, be with these dear loved ones, my dear brothers and sisters. Some have pressed their way into the house of the Lord with a heavy heart. Some have had a good week. Some have had a mediocre week. Every last one of us are on different, um, different frequencies, so to speak. But Lord, we pray by your spirit that you would captivate us through your word. And we pray that our faith will be strengthened no matter what we're facing. So that we can be determined to have a winning life. To that end, Lord, I pray that you would stand in my body, think with my mind, and speak with my tongue those things you would have us to know, say, and do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every fan wants to see their team win. I know that's hard for some of us to embrace because of how terrible your favorite team has been doing. Hello, Atlanta Falcons. But every year, you know, there's this sense of hope. Well, maybe they, they can have not a losing season, at least get into the playoffs. Every fan wants to see their team win. Every team has one goal in mind, and that is to win and win it all. And to think otherwise is to be certified crazy. But the chief end of every team is to win. The chief end of every fan is to see their team win. I, I put that out there for us to think spiritually, that our God that we sung to in these moments together, our God is a winner. He, he's a winner. We serve a winning God. His record is a trillion and zero. He does not lose. You are here on purpose. Your mom and dad might have not have planned you, but he purposed for you to be here. And God has set the stage for every last one of us to win. Hebrews chapter 11 is the great <laughs> hall of faith chapter. Yeah, the NFL got Canton, but that's just temporary stuff that's going to die out. I'm talking about something that's going to last forever. Hall of Faith. 
If you read Hebrews chapter 11, the great Hall of Faith chapter, you see a resume of a God who wins, and he wins big by working through fragile, broken people to accomplish his purposes in their lives. God is a winner. Now, the Hebrew writer transitions from talking from what God did, here's my southern, back yonder, to the reality of where we are right now. The Hebrew writer is moving from, from the past, and he's now speaking to those in the present, and by way of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's reaching through the pages of Scripture and addressing us. So when we come to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the main thought, the main idea, the summary of my message in three words is this, embrace your moment. Embrace your moment. We have one life. Embrace your moment. If you and I want to be winners, if you and I want to win big, not lowercase win, I'm talking about all caps win, and not for our glory, but for his glory. If you and I want to have a winning life, I want to encourage you, my dear loved ones, with three challenges from these two verses. And these three challenges, I pray, will be the anthem of all of our lives as we seek to have a winning life. If we want to embrace our moment, number one, here it is, we need to reject. Come on and walk with me. The text opens up, therefore, and he's, again, he's linking the great hall of faith in chapter 11, and he's bringing application to the current audience. He says, therefore, watch this, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The key word here is witnesses. Now stay with me. I need you to understand that this text has been mispreached and abused. Witnesses here does not refer to those who have died and are watching over us. That's horrible theology. Horrible theology. By the way, let me just lovingly say this. I'm not, this is not PC. This is Bible, okay? Uh, the world's not going to tell you this, but let me just tell you this based on the authority of Scripture. Every person that has physically died are in a full state of eternity. They're not with you. They're not watching over you. You don't feel their presence. The Bible says it is appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. If they are a believer, they are consumed with the glory and presence of God. And if they're not a believer, they are consumed with eternal darkness and separation from God. They're not in this present reality. They are in eternity. So witnesses here is not referring to those who have died and are watching over us. That's horrible theology. Well, what then is witnesses here? Well, you ask great questions. Simple. You, you your English class. Context is key. Context is key. The witnesses here is referring to those heroes of the faith in chapter 11. Just like they have witnessed the faithfulness of God in their moment in history, they bear witness to his faithfulness so that we too can bear witness to the faithfulness of God in our moment in history. They witness God being Jehovah Jireh. We can witness God being Jehovah Jireh. We stand on their shoulders. That's what the text is saying. We are surrounded by people who have seen God come through over and over and over and over and over again. We are surrounded by great cloud of witnesses. People who have witnessed the faithfulness of God. And in light of that reality, the writer says, let us also... Lay aside every weight. One version says, throw off. Uh, that's where I get the idea of reject. <laughs> uh, this is not a gradual thing. It's not something you stop and say, well, let me just pray about it. No, it's immediate. I'm throwing it off. Throwing off what? Every weight. These are loads. These are burdens. These are anything that hinders movement when it comes to my walk in faith with the Lord. 
Let me just stop here and just, just think and ask this question. What are some big weights that we all deal with? Of course, I can give us a lot, but let me just give you two. Uh, first of all, I'll say the weight of worry. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The weight of worry. Uh, Jesus says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. If Jesus is leaving and giving us peace, why in the world do we let fear and worry paralyze us? Some of us have no joy because we're too worried. We have no peace. Because we're too anxious. Even right now as I'm speaking, it's hard for you not to think about the things that you got going on this day and even this past week, going into this week. And the Spirit of God is saying, shh, be still and know that I am God. So one of the weights that hinders movement is the weight of worry. We can't walk in faith and be fearful at the same time. We can't walk in faith and be anxious at the same time. Here's another weight, the weight of laziness. Laziness is a killer. But let me jump on out there. I'm, I'm going into the deep end today. Spiritual laziness is a killer. Some of us have been saved for all these years and have never read through the word of God. We know the church culture, but we don't know the Lord. We know all the stats in our jobs and our careers inside and out, but we don't live in the truthfulness of his scripture. We keep going around the same issues over and over again, and God's thinking, well, when are, you, when are we going to learn? Why do we keep managing our sin instead of dealing with our sin? There's a difference. And this weight of spiritual laziness is holding us hostage from experiencing all that God has called you and I to do. That hinders movement. We can't walk in faith and be spiritually lazy at the same time. He says, lay aside every weight. Now notice, I'm just walking through it verse by verse. Again, the power is not in the preacher, the power is in the text. Look at the, look at the line. It says, and sin which clings so closely. Interesting. One version says, the sin, the sin. Now, interesting. Most scholars agree this is referring sp specifically to persistent unbelief. Why? Because over and over again in Hebrews, the writer says, today if you hear his voice, today if you hear his voice, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Unbelief is what will send people to eternal separation from God. It's unbelief. One scholar says that it was unbelief that kept Israel out of the promised land, and it is unbelief that hinders us from entering into our spiritual inheritance in Christ. This sin, he says, it clings so closely. That means that it ambushes us. It encircles us. And let's call it for what it is. Some of us, this is, the unbelief is not the problem. Okay, that's okay. We may not have an unbelief problem, but we all got a sin problem. Hello, lights. We all have a sin problem. Romans seven twenty one. this one hits home, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Sin has a way of choking the spiritual life. It has a way of blocking us from experiencing all that God has for us. There's a passage of scripture that scares the heebie-jeebies out of me, and it says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The Lord will not hear me. Every NBA player, when they, when they warm up, when they get ready to, you know, for the game, you see them in their jumpsuit. They're standing there, national anthem's being played, and they're, they're standing there on the court. They got their jumpsuit on, but when it's game time, they remove their jumpsuit. When you watch track and field players, uh, you know, they'll have their jumpsuit on, but when it's time to run, they remove 
their jumpsuit. What am I saying? What am I saying? If you and I want to move and play smoothly for the Lord, we need to at least do two things. Number one, identify what's slowing me down and get rid of it. Identify what's slowing me down and get rid of it. Now, let's just call it for what it is. We don't have to pray about it, fast about it, seek counsel about that one. We know what it is. For some of us, we know who it is. What is slowing me down? Is it a person? Is it a bad attitude? Is it something in a secret place that nobody knows but, but God knows? If I want to reject what's slowing me down, I need to identify it and get rid of it. But a second piece of application of mail I'll say is this. Let the faithful inspire us. Who are those that you can look to that have spiritual mileage? Who are those praying grandmamas or, or mentors or people that have been walking with Jesus that you can ride their coattails, that you can get wind in your metaphorical sails? Who are those people you can look up to? I think of my father, the greatest man that I know. He's poured his life into me and my siblings. Think of my mom, who's a tough woman. Love the Lord, sweet lady, but don't cross Sister Karen Loritz. My mama used to have that special anointing. Back in the day, I'm acting a fool in the last row, thinking I could sneak some candy in my mouth. I grew up in the Baptist church. You didn't do that in when the worship is going, when the choir is giving their A and B selection. That's African-American colloquialism for the first selection and the second song, for those who don't know what I'm talking about. My mama would be singing alto or second soprano, and mama would just give me a look. My life was over. Some of us know what we're talking about. But I think of my mom. I think of Dr. Dwight Perry, who taught me how to preach at Moody Bible Institute. I think of Dr. Winfrey Neely, after every homiletics class, would take me to his office and pour into me. I think about my first shot, a young 22-year-old, fresh out of Bible college, my spiritual father in the ministry, Dr. D. Darrell Griffin. I, I think of my brother, Brian Lewis. I, I think about so many who have invested in my life. Do you have anybody who has witnessed the faithfulness of God in their life that you can draw all inspiration from? Well, well, I don't have anybody, Brendan. That's okay. I thought about you when I read Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Yeah, yeah, you may not have nobody right now, but you have the word of God. You can plant your face in the scripture and see the faithfulness of God all the way from Genesis to Revelation. This is it's not just some ordinary book. It's not an ordinary book. It's a living document of the word of God, and God wants to inspire us through his faithfulness that the same God that led Moses is the same God that's in this room right now to give you what you need for the journey. So if you and I want to have a winning life, we need to reject. Reject the things that hinder movement. Grab on to those who are faithful. Grab hold to the faithfulness of God in the scripture. And watch him do more in your life in a flash than what you can do for yourself in a lifetime. If we want to win, we need to reject. Number two, oh, here we go. We need to run. Somebody say run. I'm not talking about Forrest either. Forrest Gump. No, no. We. The text says, and let us, somebody say it. No, I got to say it with authority. Let us, with endurance, the race that is set before us. This isn't an elliptical machine. This isn't a little bike. No, this is a speed. This is a race. That requires intentionality. It's not passive. It requires effort. That I'm giving it my all for the Lord. This, this race, this, this running is, is a glorious struggle. Why is it a glorious struggle? Well, I'll tell you why. Philippians 1, 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That God is working in you. And he's working through you. And what God starts, he finishes. The devil can't stop 
what God purposes for your life. And so he says, run with endurance. Here it is, the race that is set before us. Literally, 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 this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And I love this, this idea of a race. God is the one that set out the race. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved to produce fruit with works that glorify him for all of eternity. So the race that he set before us, that he's marked out before us, here it is, it's the Christian life. Listen to me, church. We, we, we are here on purpose, for a purpose, to serve the purposes of God. We are here on purpose, for a purpose, to serve the purposes of God. Paul, speaking of the Christian life as a race and staying in the race, I love this. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beat in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. One version says, make it my slave, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. We need to run. If you were to watch an NFL practice, you see quarterbacks throwing passes all the time. Uh, the wide receiver catches the ball, but you never see the wide receiver catch it and then circle back to the huddle. No, he catches the ball and he goes all the way to the end zone. Why? Because he wants to finish the play. He wants to um, ingrain in his muscle memory that when I catch, my goal is to score. What good is it for a basketball player to have Steph Curry handles but can never make a shot? I don't care how cute it is. Okay, you're doing crossover. Okay, cool. But you can never finish at the rim. Listen to me, listen to me. One of the most frustrating things is for us to start something but never finish. Some of us are excellent starters, but horrible finishers. Uh, look at the culture we live in in the Western world. Every gym is packed in January. <laughs> oh, I got, I got my plan, I got you know, keto diet, I'm going to be working out, blah, 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 blah. And you can always tell the ones who ain't going to be there very long because they're the ones doing all the extra stuff. It's just unnecessary. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. Okay, you're going to quit next week. But what good is it? They're going to quit by Valentine's Day, and it happens every single year. Listen to me. It's not about how we start. It's how we finish. God wants every individual here to finish well. I don't know about you, but I want to hear, well done, good, and faithful servant. Yeah, we all got issues. Nobody's here is perfect. But we can serve a God who can help us finish the race. Don't run at the tape. Run through it. Run through it. If you and I want to have a winning life, we need to reject. We need to run. And oh, I feel like running laps around this, this, this room because the third one, we need to look. Ah, help me, Holy Spirit. Because the text tells us, here we go. Looking to Jesus. Mm. One version says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. First Peter uh, chapter 1, there's a line in there that says that we need to fix our hope on Jesus. Several years ago, my wife and I, we bought our house in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was so excited to, to hang up my flat screen in the living room. But the brother don't have skills for that. So I picked up the phone and called the wonderful ministry of Best Buy. They sent their disciples, the Geek Squad. They walk in the house and I told them where I wanted to, to put the TV. And the guy said, okay. He goes to the wall and he starts knocking. 
And I said, what you doing? He said, well, Ms. Loritz, if you put your Samsung TV on drywall, it might look cute for a while, but it's going to cause a big mess. So what I'm doing is I'm knocking because I'm listening for a stud. You see, the stud is a set of beams that's connected to the structure of a house, and it's connected to a foundation so that when I take your TV, I can fix it, and you can enjoy the experience. And you never have to worry for it to fall down because it's fixed. Our lives will always be jacked up when we try to hang it ourselves. But when I hang my life on Jesus, this old song we used to sing in African-American tradition, that on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is seeking sand. You see, when our lives are fixed on Jesus, we're anchored. It doesn't mean we're not human. It doesn't mean we don't cry. But we're anchored. He says, fixing your eyes. That Jesus needs to be the only love person that, you, that has your soul. That you're falling in love with him. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith. One version says, author and finisher of our faith. He's a pioneer. He's the originator. Now, here's why. Here's why. I love this. Here's why. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross? Who, for the joy that was set? Who, for the joy that was set? Who, for the joy? When you study scripture, always ask the text questions. What joy is he referring to? What helped him endure the cross? God, help me preach this. What, what, what was set before him? What motivated our Savior? You ask great questions at 11.23 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Let me click off to you four things. I'm going through this real fast. Some of you like to write. Just listen and be blessed. This joy, number one, is a fact that Jesus knew he would complete the Father's will. That is, in his mind, it was a done deal. John 17, 4 says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This joy, number two, is that Jesus knew he would rise again from the dead. In other words, death could not hold him down. Acts 2, 24, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This joy, number three, is that Jesus knew he will be exalted. In other words, glory belongs to him. Not Mary, not Muhammad, not yourself. But it belongs to Jesus. Acts 2, 36, that all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And oh, number four, this joy is that Jesus knew he will present believers to the Father in glory. That is, he keeps us and his promises. Let this bless you, Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. But I'm not done. Because the text is not done. Notice. God help me, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, here it is, despising the shame. Whoa, 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 whoa. He was willing to get spat on for you. He was willing to be ridiculed and punched in the face for you and for me. He was willing to be tied to a post with his naked back out and taking a cat of nine tails, 39 lashes. He was willing to take on a 100-plus pound beam and going the Via Della Rosa up Galgotha's Hill. 
He was willing to lay with a shredded back, hands extended, with nails driven through his hands and his feet. He was willing to hang on an old rugged cross. He refused to come down. And he did this, despising the shame, which means this. He did not let anything come in the way from accomplishing the goal for redeeming you and me. All the wonder of the cross. And that's why the text says, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It is finished. It is finished. He made the payment for you and for me. And all power is in our Savior's hand. I love what Dr. Tony Evans says about this text in his commentary. He says, how did Jesus himself reach the finish line? The joy would come on Sunday, but the shame had to be endured on Friday. The Son of God made it through Friday by keeping his eyes on Sunday. We need no better example. Regardless of the suffering and trials you're facing, know that Resurrection Day is coming. Church, no matter what you are facing, he has power. If you're down and out this morning, he has power. If you need forgiveness this morning, he has power. If you need addictions to be broken this morning, he has power. If you need extra metaphorical winds in your sails this morning, he has power. If you want to go to a deeper place in your walk with Christ, he has power. Let the church praise him. He has power. He has power. And there's nothing in your life that's beyond his ability. For my God's record is a winner. And you can win. Every kid, I'm a parent, so I, I get it. Every kid, and we've all have been there, you try to do something and <laughs> they say something to the effect of, well, I can't. I can't do this, Daddy. I can't do this, Mommy. Be like my mother, she's like, well, I don't want to hear that come out your mouth again. Yes, you can. Let me help you. You know, a lot of us live our lives as if we can't get victory. As if we can't overcome. You fill in the blank. As if we can't win. Can, can, can I lovingly say this? That thought comes from the pits of hell. That is not from God. We can win because Jesus wins. And because he won on the cross, we can win in life. But we have to believe that. But you don't understand, Pastor. Okay, I may not understand your predicament. But it doesn't, it doesn't deter the, the reality that we still can win. We can win. And you have to preach that to yourself today. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I win because Jesus won. And if God can raise a dead Jesus, don't you think he can give us a winning life today? But we have to believe that. The greatest battle that we have today is the battle of here. It's the battle in the mind. And whoever has the mind will have our feet. And we have to let God's truth clothe our minds. Paul would call it the helmet of salvation, anchored in truth, so that we can be all that God's called us to be. And so if you and I want to embrace our moment, we need to reject what's hindering us. We need to run this race that God has laid before us, and we need to look to Jesus. Let the Lord metaphorically fix your life on him and watch him do amazing things in your life. What better way to start that reality than to look at Calvary? That's, that's, that's it right there. Calvary. The greatest payment ever made for your sin and my sin was on the cross of Christ. And so, 
We're going to take the Lord's table this morning. If you haven't received the elements, just lift your hand up. We'll uh, have some of the uh, ushers will come by and make sure they.